So I would like to start the, the, the discussion with that, with that common uh, phrase, right, that is very familiar to us, uh, peace, mercy, and uh, blessings from God, is something that we hear from the three main religions, religions, uh, religious traditions from Abraham, that is uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So, um, I'm going to talk about today a, a topic that is very, I think is very important and is very relevant to today's, uh, today's situation, today's world, and that is the importance of religious tolerance, uh, as, um, especially in a period of time that we live in that, that uh, there's a lot of misunderstandings and a lot of uh, misconceptions that, is, that exist out there. Um, that blurs the understanding among peoples. So, in order to contribute to a better understanding right, of other uh, of other religions, I uh, found it that the best example to do that was to go back in a time period, back in the, in the Middle Ages of uh, uh, European Middle Ages, where Islam happened to be the ruling uh, civilization in this part of Europe called the Iberian Peninsula. Okay? The Iberian Peninsula is the homeland of what today we call Spain and Portugal. Okay? So, I want to emphasize, uh, first of all, the connection there is with some of the uh, carryovers or the legacy that exists between uh, the uh, presence of Islam for almost 800 years right, in the Iberian Peninsula and how we still uh, we still uh, connect to that experience by our everyday speech by the words that we say especially when we uh, speak and those Spanish speakers are here right, to realize that we are saying Arabic words uh, every day without realizing that they are Arabic origin so we're going to look at some of that as an example of that uh, Muslim legacy in Spain. Now, uh, why do I want to do that? I wanted to do that because I want to emphasize first that language, just like other forms of expression, right, are a form of uh, cultural exchange. And when there is a cultural exchange, there's also an opportunity for peaceful dialogue and for understanding and that happened in Spain and I think that would be a good lesson for us today. I think also that is worth uh, pointing this out because the story of, uh, of Muslim Spain right, um, and the influence of Islamic Arabic culture in Spain uh, challenges misconceptions about Islam. You know, we have a, suppose, we have a view, right, uh, uh, particularly in the last uh, uh, period of the 20th century and in the 21st century, we have received a very distorted image of this religion. Uh, this religion has been associated with violence, this religion has been associated with opinions, uh, and crimes, and terrorism, so, and intolerance, religious intolerance. 
So we're going to see that uh, there's actually a lot of misconceptions about those views. That's one of the, that's one of the challenges that we have here. Um, we're going to find that Muslim Spain actually was one of the most tolerant places in the world at that time. And I'm going to give you some examples of that. Um, I want to start with asking you guys about a word in Spanish that um, you Spanish speakers. How many Spanish speakers are here, by the way? Or don't know some Spanish? Um, okay. So, um, the Spanish speakers are here, and those who do not speak Spanish, you're going to learn a little bit of this too. But there is a common word that we use uh, in the Spanish language called ojalá. Uh, what does that mean? Hopefully. Hopefully, right? Maybe we say ojalá, what, ojalá, no llueva, right? Ojalá pase el examen, right? Ojalá, uh, ojalá ella me quiera, right? Um, uh, so ojalá, we hope that things happen, right? Okay, so ojalá is a very common word that people use all the time. All the time. You probably used it today earlier. You didn't even realize it. Ojalá is and ojalá that. Now, ojalá has a, um, that word actually has a root in the Arabic. Okay, and it's a corrupted form of the word la shala. Okay, and I will actually tell you how that sh sound turned into a j or a sound, right, in Spanish. Uh, that was just the Spanish language that also changed a lot in the last a hundred years. So uh, originally when the Castilian speakers right, who live alongside Arabic, Arabic speakers in the Iberian Peninsula, they um, they introduced in their vocabulary the word uh, washala, okay, which is very similar to inshallah, which is a word that's also used by Arabic speakers and in the Muslim world as well, which means God, if God wills it, okay, if God would will it. So this is another, this is an example of that word. Now, just like ojalá, right, there are many other words out there in the Hispanic uh, culture and in the language uh, that, uh, that, we can, uh, that we can identify. Uh, uh, yeah, I kind of, or can I see if you can see this in the camera? Can you all see that? Okay, so look at all of those words that you might probably have used at some point, right, during the, during the week or during the, during the day, right, and some of you guys who do not uh, speak Spanish, you realize here there's a lot of words, right, that have um, Arabic, uh, Arabic uh, origin, aceite, aceitune, and even words that, uh, that resonate with the border area, right? Words like aduana, for instance, because we have a custom house here, right? Um, eh, Alcabala, right? A custom house also. Alcalde, you know, you elect the mayor, right? Um, in Nuevo Laredo, Monterrey, you guys are from Monterrey, with alcaldes in, in uh, Monterrey, in Mexico, right? So all of these words come from the Arabic. Um, even some words that means something but later became last names like for instance Alcantara Alcantara is a very common last name in, in Hispanic uh, uh, in Latin America for instance Alcala is also a very um, a very common Alcasa also is a very common last name but it means something too it means they mean uh, things they either mean a, a bridge or a fortress or some kind of uh, other object uh, the word alcohol <coughs> Aldea, village. Right? Alfarero, the person who makes a uh, uh, shaves form, so the potter. Right? Alfombra, algebra. You know, um, uh, many of you take algebra here, right? So without without algebra, then um, it's very it's very difficult to go about uh, higher education. So algebra is very important because it comes from uh, it is one of those sciences that was transmitted from the Muslim world to the rest of the West. So we have many words like this. I don't intend to show you all of the words, but there are many Spanish words that have certain um, that have certain uh, root in Arabic. The word barrio, if 
for instance, you live in a barrio, right? Barrio is a neighborhood, right? So that's also an Arabic word. Uh, cifra, number, jinete, árabe, tarea, tarifa. So all of those words are from that. So my question is, why are there so many? Uh, why are there so many Spanish words that have Arabic origin? We know that there's some coexistence between the Arab speakers that brought Islam right into Spain and lived there for a hundred years, right? And uh, we also know that in order for this to be possible, right, uh, the people who were non-Muslims, right, have to have some kind of constant interaction with those who were Muslims in order to pick up the words that they heard from the Muslims that the Muslims were speaking. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. okay. So the question the next question will be how did Islam get into Spain? Anybody venture to have a guess on how Islam finally arrived in Spain? In what way? Was that immigration? Uh, yes, there was some kind of that. Uh, I guess you can call it that. But uh, there was one part of it was immigration, definitely. Another was going to be uh, a mobilization. It was going to come through conquest, right? So let's actually look at the background of that and how Islam came about in Spain, and not only Spain but other parts of the world too. And later we're going to talk about the Muslim, the Caliphate that was created in Spain, okay? and the word Al-Andalus, and look at the origin of that word, which is the focus of our presentation. We're also going to look, um, apart from that, we're going to look at examples of, um, of how this Caliphate of Cordoba became sort of like the example to follow for the rest of, uh, for the rest of other cities uh, in Europe. Uh, it became a cultural center, it became a very advanced... Uh, uh, still the legacy of Muslim Spain was carried on, and more interestingly, it was carried over by people who were, uh, we can say, were non-Muslims, even uh, uh, Christians themselves, and Jews, right? They tried to carry on that legacy from Muslim Spain. something interesting happening there by the Christian cities that are recovering to Spain. And uh, we're also going to look at the art. We're going to look at some examples of architecture, we're going to look at some examples of artistic expressions that show how this communication between cultures happened, how this religious tolerance was reflected through this exchange. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Jewish population of uh, Muslim Spain. Um, because Muslims, uh, Muslims, but Christians, but also Jews, played a big role in this society. And then we should uh, go into the question 
uh, session if you have a questions about the topic or any, in, any major uh, comment you want to introduce on the web. So let's look at how Islam arrived in the Peninsula and how it declined from uh, 711 to uh, 1492. Let's start with the word Al-Andalus. Al-Andalus is the word that the Muslim Arabs gave to Spain when they first arrived there. So when people talk about Andalus, Andalusian, they're referring to this word. Uh, in fact, we go to Spain nowadays and people refer to the southern part of Spain as Andalusia. Right? So that's a province of modern Spain today. And it comes from that Arabic word. The word for Al-Andalus might have been an Arabic corruption of the Visigothic. Visigothic were the people who lived in, um, they, they were the Germanic people who lived in Spain before the Arabs arrived there. From the word Vandalus. The Vandals, I don't know if you've heard these people before there. Historically, the Vandals have occupied uh, many areas of the former Roman Empire in North Africa and in Spain. So, <clears throat> it was used to describe the areas of Arabic Muslim influence in the Iberian Peninsula, including what today are the countries of Spain and Portugal, from 711 to 1492, roughly 779 years, almost 800 years. Now, the word Islam. The word Islam uh, is being um, uh, some uh, uh, interpretations and some pronunciations. Uh, the most common pronunciation for this is surrender or submission, right? Submission to the will of God. It's a monotheistic faith. Islam is a monotheistic faith founded by Muhammad ibn Abdullah in the early 7th century after receiving divine revelation from Allah. Now, what does the word Allah mean? So, it means God, right? I'm going to stop right there for a moment because Allah doesn't mean that there is a, an Islam, there is a, God, a moon God, you know, the people that the, moon, that the Muslims worship, right? Or something like a, some kind of like a, a very angry God that's by that name. So that's not, a, that's not what it actually is. Allah is just simply an Arabic word that means the God, okay? So if you ask a Christian, in the Arab world, if you go to Palestine and you ask a Christian Palestine, look, what is the word for God, right, that you use, and he will tell you Allah. So if you go to Mass, he will go be praying to Allah in the Mass, in the Christian Mass. So it's just a word that means the God, okay? So not to be, not to create confusion, and I'm trying to, more than that, not to create confusion, I'm trying to create a commonality, right? We have more things in common with Islam than you think. Okay, as, and this is a good example of that. By the late 7th and the 8th centuries, Arab tribes, right, Arabic tribes now converted to this religion, right? They were united under this new religion and launched expeditions, right? They began to launch expeditions into the previous former powers of the region, into other empires that surrounded the Arabian Peninsula from where Islam came from. And those two empires were the Sassanid Empire of Persia and the Byzantine Empire in the East Mediterranean. <coughs> this expanded Muslim influence from India in the East to the African Atlantic coast in the West. So that in a matter of years, in a matter of probably 30, 40 years, uh, Islam um, uh, Islamic uh, civilization that was in the Islamic civilization that was emerging, right, was uh, conquering right these parts of the Middle East, and it would extend as far as the Indus River Valley in what today is Pakistan, close to India, right, all the way to North Africa and in the countries that we today call Morocco and uh, Mauritania and so on. So this is where in the part, the western part of that expansion, that's where Spain began to play a role. Right, because it's getting it's close to that westward expansion. By 711, Muslims crossed the Strait of Gibraltar. You heard of that word too, right? Gibraltar. The Strait of Gibraltar is that very narrow piece of uh, strait that divides Europe from Africa, right between Morocco and Spain. It's a very narrow strait, right? And Gibraltar means, it's an Arabic word that means Jabal Tariq, Jabal Tariq. Right, which is Gibraltar, later it was corrupted into Gibraltar. It means the mountain of Tariq. Tariq was the commander who led the armies across the strait. 
The Muslim commander who headed the expedition across the land conquered most of the Iberian Peninsula, today Spain and Portugal from the, lo from the local Christian Visigoths. Right? So it was relatively an easy conquest. There was a lot of divisions by the Visigoths and, in Spain, and it took a relatively a, a very short period of time for the Muslim armies to really uh, pacify the whole of the Peninsula. It actually was more difficult for the Arabs to pacify the Berbers of North Africa, right, because they've actually put a more resistance than the Christian Visigoths in Spain. <clears throat> so the Muslim armies in Spain continued, right, they wanted to continue into northern European areas and they crossed the Pyrenees. The Pyrenees are the mountains that divide today France and Spain. So the Muslims crossed the Pyrenees, right, and they established certain, occupied certain towns in the other part of the Pyrenees, in the Frankish areas, but they lost a battle, the Battle of Tours, in 1755. So after the Battle of Tours, Islam doesn't move anymore into Europe, but it returns back into the Iberian Peninsula, and it's going to stay there for almost 800 years, okay? So <clears throat> that's what we have for, uh, for now, how Islam arrived. Into, uh, into Spain, into what we call an Andalus. Now, when we said uh, that there was a, um, that there was um, a caliphate, right? we're going to talk about that word. It's also a word that we hear a lot today because we associate it with the caliphate of, or the pseudo caliphate that some uh, terrorists want to create in the Middle East, right? It had nothing to do with a caliphate. And in fact, when you see this, you'll realize that whatever we hear in the news is just an aberration of what a true caliphate should be. Okay. Um, and the caliphate that's going to be established is the caliphate in the city of Cordoba. Okay. So in Arabic, they call the city of Cordoba. Cordoba was a city, a Visigothic Christian city before the Muslim occupation. And it's going to become the main center of learning in Spain and arguably of the whole European continent at that time. So we're going to look uh, at it in more detail. So the Muslims have arrived into Cordoba right here in the green. You can um, see the, uh, uh, this is the extent of conquest, right? In a very few amount of years, this is how much the, the Muslim, the Muslim uh, armies have crossed and have established themselves they cross the Pyrenees at the Battle of Tours, they return, and basically they are controlling the Iberian Peninsula. So this is going to be our story over here. Um, Islamic society, after the passing of the Prophet, and after the four, um, the four leaders, or the three leaders that followed, um, actually it was four leaders, right, the caliphs, the four caliphs. The four leaders that followed the Prophet, the founder of Islam, right, after the passing of these four leaders, Islam, basically, um, Islamic society, Islamic civilization turns into an empire in that it, like many of its neighbors, right, like many societies and civilizations of the time, it inherit this idea of monarchy. Okay, so the caliphates look more like kingdoms after the passing of the caliph. And then we have two main dynasties that are going to uh, dominate Islam, starting in the 8th century. One is going to be the Umayyad, right, from the Umayyad family, of the Arabian Peninsula now they are based um, they were based in the city of Damascus right in today's Syria I'm sure that you also hear Syria in the news today right and the Abbasid Caliphate later on who was ruling from Kufa and later from the city of Baghdad in what today is Iraq okay? now by 1750 right if you look in the green area those are the areas that the Umayyad control but by 1750 the Abbasids took over Damascus and killed the Umayyad family. So the surviving prince, Abdul Rahman, Abdul Rahman the first, escaped and made it to Al Andalus. So he basically he made a trip from all the way from Damascus to North Africa, and he ended up in Cordoba. So he intended to move the caliphate that had been lost in Damascus and move it all the way. Turn himself the true ruler, right? The Abbasids, in his eyes, were pretty much like the. Um, like uh, we would call uh, the intruders, like the right? So he was the true caliph. So he, in 1756, Abdul Rahman declared the Umayyad Caliph is still alive, now moved to Cordoba, Al-Andalus, 
Cordoba will be then the capital of the Caliphate of Cordoba. The Cordoba Caliphate lasted from 756 until 1036. Now, do we have an idea now how Islam made it into Spain? Okay. So, here then our story begins, uh, giving you more, more information and more history about the about Al-Andalus. Cordoba, the Cordoba Caliphate represented the highest expression of power and cultural influence of Islam, not only in Spain, but in the Western European uh, continent, for centuries to come. There was a golden age under the reigns of Abdul Rahman III and his son al Hakam in the 10th century. However, uh, the caliphate was going to decline and was going to be dissolved from the inside. Civil wars were going to break out and unfortunately the caliphate was going to uh, go into a, uh, into a period of decline. Civil wars of fitna, also fitna is a word that uh, Arabic and also in, the, in Islam connotes uh, 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 internal battles, internal struggles, like civil wars. He brought the fitna brought the caliphate to an end and beginning of the city-state period of Taifa period in the 11th century. So we don't have a united caliphate anymore after the 11th century. But we have our cities, independent cities all over the place, Right? Trying to put things together and trying to claim Cordoba's power. They're trying to create their cities or trying to recreate it in the same kind of status that Cordoba used to have before. Okay? We'll see that they don't accomplish that. But the ones who come close to accomplish that, ironically, are not going to be the Muslims, but are going to be the Christians who come later in the 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th century. The American power that is beginning to replace Cordoba is the Christian Kingdom of Castilla. Now, <clears throat> you guys who are Spanish speakers, right, you speak Spanish, right? But do you know that in Spain we have Catalan, we have Vasco, we have Ga Gallego, right? There's many, many dialects, right? But you, the kind of Spanish that we speak here is Castilian Spanish. We speak Castellano, right? So where does that word come from? <coughs> Castellano. You come from the Kingdom of Castilla. Castilla is the main king, Christian kingdom that is emerging to fill the vacuum of the Cordoba Caliphate. Okay? So it's the most powerful kingdom in the peninsula that is trying to reclaim the peninsula for Christianity. Now the, the Christian kingdom of Castilla in the north took the city of Toledo. Right? Toledo is one major city that we're going to hear about too. In, 18, in 1085 from its Muslim ruler, Castilla then began to expand to other parts of Andalusia. Or part of and this is when things begin to have to change. Um, <clears throat> the Pope at the time, right, the Pope, uh, the, uh, the Catholic Pope, was Urban II. Urban II, in the year of 1095, he called for a crusade against Muslims. In, uh, not only Muslims in Spain, but also against Ottoman Turks in the East. And he calls for the recovering of the Holy Land in Jerusalem. Okay. Now he, think, he thinks that it's a duty for every Christian to go fight to recover, uh, recover the Holy Land. Um, let's recall that Muslims have occupied and lived in Jerusalem since the year of 637. Okay, so very early on, the Muslims have been living in Jerusalem for some centuries. So we have uh, here, we have an addition. Uh, uh, an injection of some kind of religious uh, uh, religious militancy that we have not seen yet happen. Right? And he actually is going to, in a way, is going to worsen the relations between Christians and Muslims at that time. Because on the other hand, the Muslims also bring their own brand of, of, uh, of a holy war mentality. Okay? Especially with the Berber tribes that live in North Africa. The Berber tribes of North Africa comes and pass into Spain. Um, they actually are successful in stopping the Christian armies for some time, right? And they establish themselves in Al Andalus. These two Berber tribes are going to be known as the Almoravids and the Almohades. The Almohades and the Almoravids. Okay. 
the Almoravids and the Almohads, uh, they are not Andalusians, they're outsiders, they, don't, they didn't live in the Cordoba Caliphate, so they don't know that interaction between Christians and Muslims and Jews that existed in the Caliphate, right? So for the Almoravids and for the Almohads, that idea that I'm going to be a friend with a Christian, that's really not good, or that Jews, right? It's not good. As far as the Almoravids and the Almohads are concerned, um, they actually want to impose a very strict form of Islam into the Spanish Peninsula that no, no people have actually have known before. So we see, like an, uh, what we see on the Christian side with the Crusades, there is a militancy toward holy war, but there's also some uh, strictness also happening among the Berber tribes that uh, came into the, uh, into the Iberian Peninsula later. The Kingdom of Castile, however, took Sevilla in 1249, 1245 from Almohad rulers. Sevilla became the new capital of Castilla. The Nasri Kingdom of Granada was founded and it was the last independent Muslim kingdom in Spain. So by the 14th century, basically the Muslim, Muslim rule had been confined to only a corner here. And for a century, that corner, that Muslim kingdom was called the Kingdom of Granada. But in 1492, which is a year that you probably are very familiar with, right? 1492, the discovery of the Americas. Well, that same year, uh, the ruler of Granada, Mabil, a Castilian pronunciation of Abu, uh, Abu Abdullah, right? That's how the Abdil was the way that the Catholic people knew him. He surrendered to Isabel de Castilla and Fernando de Aragón. And with this surrender, Islamic rule in the Iberian Peninsula came to an end. So, 1492, that's a year to remember. 1492 was the year where the last <coughs> independent Muslim kingdom in Spain uh, uh, still, still, uh, uh, still remained. So, now from this story, it suggests that there's a lot of um, back and forth, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a reconquista going on, right? The Christians are reconquering the the peninsula. But that's not quite, uh, doesn't quite tell you the whole story of what's happening here. It's more complex than that. We will see that uh, um, these conflicts used to be more political than religious, actually. So let me, uh, let me continue then with what kind of <coughs> this question to what kind of cultural achievement emerged in Al-Andalus and what was the government of the Port of Arcadia? What was the basis for religious toleration under the Caliphate? How did Islamic culture from the Caliphate and future Muslim kingdoms in the peninsula influence Christians and Jews? Could political cooperation and alliances between Muslim and Christian kingdoms be possible? What do al Andalus teaches us today? So, these are some of the questions that are going to break some of these misconceptions about Islam and also misconceptions about the interaction between Christians and Muslims uh, at that particular time period. What was the golden age of the Caliphate of Cordoba? The Caliphate lasted for almost 300 years, during which most of the Iberian Peninsula was under control and stability. The most important accomplishment was the guarantee of religious liberties. Religious liberties. The basis for religious tolerance and diversity is in the Quran, and this is very important. I want to I wanna actually captivate your attention here for just a moment. Um, the idea has been uh, that we've heard uh, oftentimes that um, in certain parts of the world, in certain Muslim countries, right, we do see a repression of minority religions, or minority of religious minorities. We do see that. But we can say, right, with authority, right, that that doesn't have a Islamic basis. Because the, first of all, the main source of knowledge and the main source of principles of the Muslim faith, right, is the Quran. That for Muslim, that is the holy word of God, right? That's the divine revelation. And in the Quran, you find, you are going to find these verses. I'm going to recite them here. There shall be no compulsion in religion. So, what does that mean? Should I force somebody to accept the religion of Islam? Should I make him a Muslim if he doesn't want to be? That's according to the Quran, right? It doesn't, doesn't say that, right? We believe in Allah. Again, Allah means what? 
the God, right? So the God, the God that has no equal, the God that is transcends human understanding, right? So Jews and Christians have talked about this similar concept of God, very, very similar. We're gonna see that's very, that's very, they have it in common. We believe in Allah and what has been sent down to us and Yaqub. Yaqub is actually the person who is the father of the Jews, of the Jewish nation, of the Israelites, right? Yaqub is what in the Bible, in the Christian Bible, we call Israel. Okay? Uh, the, the person who was the, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. So, in the Quran it says, uh, we believe in Allah and what has been sent down to us and Yaqub and the tribes, right? The tribes, the son, the 12 tribes of and, Jacob. and what Moses and Jesus, and this is very important, right, because Moses is a major prophet, right, for all three religions, for Judaism, for Christianity, and for Islam. But Moses had a very important role to play in Judaism because he brought the law, right, the Jewish law. So here the Quran is saying that uh, even Moses and Jesus were given these revelations. And what all the prophets were given by the Lord, we do not differentiate between any of them. So what is the Quran saying here? That what they have in common, we also have in common, right? And what they believe in, we also believe in. That what the prophets and the people that you call in very high esteem, you also held in high esteem. So isn't this the vocabulary that actually encourages equality and bringing people to the second, right? But bringing people in the, with a certain uh, people of a certain background, of a certain religious background together, there's something that unites them, right? Dispute not, and this is the Quran again. Dispute not with the people of the book, the people of the view, the book of Al Al Kitab, which is basically um, uh, the people of the earlier revelation, right? Jews and Christians, say it in the fairer manner, except for those of them that do what's right. I can tell them if there's something, something wrong, you have to stand up for. What's right? We believe in what has been sent down to us and what has been sent down to you. Our God and your God is one, right? And to Him we have surrendered. So the Quran is addressing here the people of the book and the Muslims. So do they believe in the same God? According to this verse, I mean, you interpret it the way you want it, okay? Uh, but I'm going to leave this interpretation to you. Uh, and of his signs uh, is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the diversity of your languages and your colors. Indeed, in that are signs for those of knowledge. So people of different religions, people of different people of different uh, languages, people of different races, right? All are basically this diversity is the will of God, right? So it's something to be celebrated, it's something to embrace. Right? So this is the message that the core message, the core Quranic message by which the Muslim uh, conquerors in, in, in Spain, right, bring with them and they're going to put into practice in, uh, in Spain when they rule it. Um, there's actually uh, a group of people here that uh, in Cordoba, in the Cordoba Caliphate, that are going to be known as the Mossadabs. The Mossadabs are Christians, right, they don't, they don't convert to Islam. Right. But they remain Christian. So they remain Christian, but they remain Christian in an Arabized way. So in other words, they learn Arabic, and they even were telling the Mass in Arabic okay, at that time. And this is a testimony here that I'm going to read to you real quick about a person in the 9th century that was very <laughs> upset that Christians were speaking too much Arabic. Okay. So the Christians love to read the poems and romances of the Arabs. Christians have even forgotten their own language, their own language that was lacking. Uh, there are a thousand who can express themselves with elegance and write better poems in Arabic than the Arabs themselves. So these are Christians who do not accept Islam, but yet were speaking in Arabic and were and believed that the Arabic language was more more poetic. It was more uh, it, it conveyed certain meanings better than the Latin, right? So much that this guy who makes this comment, he doesn't approve of what he's seeing, right? He's just lamenting this. Too bad that these Christians are doing this, right? But that's what, you know, tells you something about, um, tells you something about the people uh, of the time. Uh, the Jews also, Jewish community, that's another strong point. It fared better under the Caliphate than any time in European history. Um, 
Uh, European Jewry, Jews in Europe have been a tragic story, right? There's actually no need to re-emphasize this. Uh, from the pogroms of the Middle Ages until the, the Holocaust uh, in 1945, uh, the Jewish experience in Europe has been a tragedy in, 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 the, in the continent. Now, the Jewish experience under the Caliphate was a golden age. The Jews have never fared better in Europe in any time in their history than they fared in the Muslim Caliphate of Portugal. Which is actually very interesting given that there is a lot of uh, uh, misunderstanding too about Jew Jewish and Muslim relations. Uh, particularly because of political issues today regarding Israel and Palestine and so on. It, uh, it blurs the uh, historical background. Evidence suggests that mixed blood marriage happened between Arab, Berber, North African, and physical Christians, nobles, and others. Okay. So let's continue on the Cordova Caliphate. What was the golden age of the Cordova Caliphate like? Well, we have said that Abdul Abdur Rahman I was the only prince that escaped Damascus and then he brought the caliphate and he wanted to create that, the Umayyad caliphate and he wanted to uh, establish it in Cordoba, right? When we used to work the Cordoba caliphate and the Umayyad caliphate, we're saying the same thing. Okay? It's just that the Umayyad caliphate is no longer in Damascus, but it's now in Cordoba. But they, they are basically they're referring to the same family that ruled in Syria. Now, a descendant, of, a descendant of his called Abdul Rahman III in the 10th century. Uh, this was probably the period of more prosperity, power, and security for Al Andalus. Uh, the golden age of Al Andalus came under Abdul Rahman III. Abdul Rahman III was probably the best ruler that ever existed in Al Andalus history. Uh, he probably, the, I don't know if you've heard of Charlemagne, because of you have taken history courses. Charlemagne is probably the quintessential king right, of, of Christianity, the perfect Christian king, the perfect man, noble, courageous, uh, uh, elegant, uh, poetic, and so on, right? So he's the perfect uh, ruler, right? the ideal ruler, kind of like King Solomon of the Bible. So Abu Rahman was kind of like that person in the court of Calvary. The influence on Christians outside of Andalus was also uh, very important. Cordoba became so known that the caliphate sent people abroad to open relations with other kingdoms. The caliphate had advisors and it had diplomatic uh, people who would travel to uh, the Holy Roman Empire and then uh, exchange gifts and exchange, uh, uh, exchange communication, exchange uh, treaties and so on, right? Uh, there was uh, this tale by a German known by the name of Perspuita, uh, who was visited by these uh, most of our Christians that were sent to the Holy Roman Empire. And she's never been to Portland. She's never traveled there. She's never set foot in Spain in her life. But from what this monk, what this Catholic, uh, this Mozart priest was telling her about Cordoba, she later wrote a poem and she wrote something comparing Cord Cordoba to the ornament of the world. Now, when you describe something like the ornament of the world, that means that that's a very beautiful place, right? That's unequal in beauty, unequal in, uh, in, in splendor. Uh, there were also embassies sent to the Byzantine Empire. You would not believe it, but Abdul Rahman, best man, the right hand man of Abdul Rahman III, was a Jewish vizier by the name of Asdai ibn Shaprut. He visited the Christian kingdom of the Byzantine Empire and created an alliance with the Cordoba Caliphate. Right. So, this is a Muslim king who is uh, employing a Jewish um, minister to cement and create a relation with the most powerful Christian kingdom in the Eastern Mediterranean. So that's kind of like a very interesting uh, chain, right, of context. Yeah, it's a very interesting political move. More importantly, uh, this is the kind of um, the kind of exchanges that happen over time that going to happen somewhere else too. In Shapur, the minister of Abdul Rahman, 
He put together a team of translators, including Christian and Muslim translators. Why do they want to put together these translators? They want to translate an original copy of a Greek book that dates to the first century. Now, this Greek book has been preserved by the Byzantines and has been translated, translated into Arabic. This book actually has the most advanced knowledge in medicine available in the world at that time. So, it's a, a copy of that book is right here. This is an Arabic copy of that book. So, if I wanted to cement a good relationship with another kingdom, I would let change things like a book that were put in my in the royal library that would have the latest knowledge not only in medical science but also in astronomy and mathematics, right, and in other in other endeavors. So those were the kind of cultural exchange that we see happening between the Muslim Caliphate of Cordoba and the Byzantine Empire, the Christian Byzantine Empire in the East. This is another interesting fact that probably you don't know about. It. How many of you would think that a future pope of the Catholic Church, future pope, before he became pope, right, this person was a scholar, he was a good writer, he was an intellectual. And he went to study, to get his education in Muslim Spain, right? This was a French Catholic priest, right, who would later become a pope in the future, who went to get his education in Muslim Spain. And his name was Gerbert de Aurillac. Then later he became known as Pope Sylvester II in the 10th century. Do we know that we have a Pope that went to get educated in Muslim Spain, in a Muslim country, or in a Muslim caliphate? We were not thought of that, right? Because when we think about getting the best education today, we've got to go to Oxford, London, right? We've got to go to uh, Harvard in Massachusetts, right? And these are the higher institutions of knowledge. Back in the Middle Ages, uh, Cordoba was probably the best places to go and get a, an education. And even a Christian uh, minister that will become a pope later on realized that. Another, uh, another interesting fact. Um, Gerber de Arilac is credited for bringing the Arabic numbers into Europe. The numbers that we use today, uh, the figures that we use today, right? One, two, three, four, of the way to nine. Right? Those symbols actually originate from India. The Arabs actually absorbed them, uh, um, adopted the number system, and they eventually took it to Al Andalus. And from Al Andalus and Cordoba, the people who came into contact with Al Andalus and Cordoba then brought that knowledge to the rest of Europe. So, Pope Sylvester II, when he was still not a Pope, is credited for having brought the digits, the numbers, the, the Arabic numerals that we use today. So that's another form of, um, of cultural action. Cordoba right, rival Baghdad as the most cultural city, perhaps in the world at that time, certainly more than any European city of the 10th century. Cordoba, the city of Cordoba had night lighting and paved streets. You cannot say that of any European city at the time. Cordoba was something ahead of its time uh, in, the, in the 18th century. Cordoba had sewage systems and public baths. Right? It was a super clean city where hygiene was important. Uh, hospitals and medics were available. So we have this idea of the hospital right, where you have professional physicians tending to people with all sorts of instruments and all sorts of knowledge. These people are very knowledgeable about what they're doing. The largest libraries with the largest collections of books known in Europe were also in Cordoba. And the architectural style of distinctive horseshoe arches and geometrical art, geometrical art are going to have a very strong influence. From 11 to the 15th centuries, Muslim and Christian rulers, and I emphasize here Christian rulers included, right? try to make their cities look like Cordoba. Cordoba was sort of like the Rome of Spain. It was sort of like the Constantinople, right? It was sort of like the Alexandria. That, that city was so much splendor that everybody wants to go back to, that everybody dream of, or recreating again. So both Muslim and Christian rulers would try to create, in their own fashion, they try to recreate that Cordoba dream. And so these are some pictures uh, Cordoba, this is not so much like over here, but uh, can you see that? A little bit, more or less. Is there a way that we can turn this off? This light off here? Oh, yeah. Right. Without turning off everything? Okay. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Alright. So here is the mosque of 
uh, Cordoba, the great mosque of Cordoba, built in the 8th century and finished by Abdul Rahman III in the 18th century. And these horseshoe arches, can you see these horseshoe ar arches here? This is going to be very distinctive architecture that everybody else is going to replicate later on. And architecture is very important for all expressions. You will see later on very interesting uh, pictures that I'm going to show you showing uh, that expression. Like here, for instance, is also another building in Cordoba. It's what the Medina of Asaba. Uh, Medina is the word for city or town, right? a uh, population center. And this was the royal palace of Abdul Rahman III. Now, that palace was ruined, was destroyed, and we only see the ruins over here and some of the gardens. But this, again, is the example of the architecture that they were developing that was going to be very distinctive of Cordoba, and everybody else was going to try to copy or replicate. How did Muslim culture from the Caliphate and future Muslim kingdoms in the peninsula influence Christians and Jews? After the Cordoba Caliphate ended in the 11th century, Christian Castilian kingdoms made cities like Toledo and Sevilla major centers of learning. They wanted to match the prestige of Cordoba, and to some extent they did. The last Muslim kingdom of Granada, also in the 14th and 15th centuries, achieved some remarkable splendor. Muslim and Christian Spain included, Muslim influence in Christian Spain included, architecture, symmetrical art, as opposed to figurative art. Do you know why that is? Anybody knows here why Islamic art does not represent images? There's actually a, uh, there's actually a, well we don't want to say a doctrine, but there is a, uh, a tradition, right, in the Quran and in the Hadiths, in the, tra in the traditions uh, that are attributed to the Prophet, um, that, that uh, prohibits or that limits uh, the making of idols, right, or the making of certain figures, right, that can draw your attention from the true nature of God. You see, when you look at pictures and things like that, you might become distracted by that picture. And again, that's just an interpretation. There's many interpretations in the Muslim world about this. There are Muslims actually in some parts of the world that, that have a figurative art in their mosque, right? For instance, in Iran, you go to Iran today, you see Shia Muslims, uh, they actually engage in that. But in, uh, the, the Muslims here in Spain, they, like other Muslims, they actually created the art with very little uh, figures. So they are concentrated in making uh, symmetry and geometrical figures in a, in a very intricate way and in a very skillful way. And, you know, and it, it may actually emerge in a very uh, it emerged in a way that no other civilization have tried to do before. So it's very Islamic and it's very distinct from other civilizations. Language. Arabic was the sacred language because it's the language in which the Quran was written, right? But it was the language also of science. Arabic also became the language of science and philosophy. Christian and Jewish scholars right, were Arabic speakers. So under both Muslims and to a less extent Christian, uh, they spoke Arabic. Okay? So if you wanted to learn the latest, uh, the latest knowledge on Aristotle or Plato from Greek philosophy, most of these words were already translated into Arabic. The language of learning was Arabic. Right? If, we, if you actually wanted to be a scholar, like the Pope uh, that we talked about, he had to learn Arabic to do that. Uh, transmission of the most advanced literary, scientific, and philosophical knowledge available anywhere in the world. From the House of Wisdom, House of Wisdom in Baghdad, to Cordoba, to Toledo, to the rest of the world. Uh, many of this knowledge also included astrolabs and uh, instruments of navigation. A lot of technology made it from Al-Andalus into the rest of Europe. Uh, astronomical knowledge, mathematical knowledge, uh, navigation. This is uh, an instrument to navigate and to see the constellations. Um, the Muslims have been working on this for many centuries already before it arrived into Europe. Arab literature and poetry influenced the new Romance languages too of the Iberian Peninsula and Western Christendom. Trovador tradition influenced by Muwashaha, Arab poetry and musical instruments from Andalus. So here you can see two guys, one uh, Arab guy and a Christian guy playing a lute. And the lute is an instrument, it's an Arab instrument that made it eventually into uh, Christian uh, kingdoms. Um, 
What's really interesting about this also is that the word, um, uh, how do you say the word guitar in Spanish? Guitar, right? Okay. The word guitar is a Greek word that goes somewhere, uh, some, something like sitara, something like that. Okay. Now, the word sitara was you can still use today in India to describe an instrument. That, um, that uh, called the sitar, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's very beautiful instruments that, that very melodic and hypnotic sound of that lot. Uh, but the war sitara was also brought by the Arabs who went to Spain, right, to describe the string instruments, right, that look like the, you know, like any instrument, any string instrument that the Greeks used to call sitar. So the war guitar, guitarra, right, comes from that word sitar. It's not an Arabic word. But it's a word that the Arabs picked up from somewhere and brought it to uh, brought it to Spain, and people call it that. We're going to see that also happen with the word. Uh, actually, that happened with the word. <clears throat> it's another word that I can't. It's on top of my mind right now. But the the, the word, the words that also um, fur the same uh, had the same uh, the, the same uh, the same experience. Um, are you familiar with um, chivalry? Medieval chivalry? Okay. Um, you probably heard of these, uh, uh, especially in the Middle Ages, in the times of the Middle Ages, where there were people who, uh, uh, who fought as knights. You heard of the knights, right? And their stories of chivalry. The story of a chivalry is the gentleman, right, of a noble in armor, right, an armored knight, right, who goes on horseback to fight some dangerous mission, right, and then he goes back to his damsel, his, his lovely um, promised woman, he's waiting for him, right, with open arms, right, after his heroic uh, deed, right, to congratulate him. So that sounds to us like the Don Quixote, right, and it sounds like the you know, when the Don Quixote was trying to, uh, to criticize, he was trying, he was trying to, 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 to depict, right? But this idea of the chivalry, the chivalry code, right? In which the person, in which the, the knight, or the, the person of arms in the Middle Ages, the soldier, right? The knight was somebody who fought, was somebody who was brave, somebody who was courageous, but somebody who was respectful too, somebody who respected what was right. Somebody who fought for what was right. Somebody who fought for justice, right? Somebody who was not uh, sneaky or was not uh, uh, somebody who was not uh, um, backbiting or double dealing. Somebody who was square dealing and somebody who was right and fair, right? So that was the the values of the chivalry code of the nobles of the Middle Ages. A lot of that chivalry code actually comes from uh, the early Muslim experience, especially in Arabia. The Arab tribes have something very similar to their code. In fact, uh, some people have even uh, compared the son-in-law of the Prophet. He was very brave, he was a good fighter, right? Mystic too, right? He had this relation, mystical relation with God, right? Uh, he was very charismatic, he was a very good speaker, so he was a complete person in all, in all forms, right? So, a lot of these chivalry code, ironically enough, of uh, uh, being um, a Influence have been influenced by the uh, by the Muslims in the Spanish part. Um, how many of you have heard of the Divine Comedy of Dante Alighieri? Um, this the epic poem that talks about how Dante went to hell and he went to purgatory and he went to heaven. Right? So this is a story he says he's describing the different levels of hell, but then along the way he describes the different people that he finds in hell, right? And then he goes and makes his travel up to Purgatory, which is kind of like this, for those of you who are not familiar with that, Purgatory in Catholic, in Catholic doctrine is a place where the souls go that are not going to hell yet or are not going to heaven yet. It's sort of like a limbo place, right? And then there's heaven, where people who are going to paradise, then they're going to go to heaven. And there are different, different uh, levels of heaven. So, not all heaven is equal, but there are different levels that are superior than other levels of heaven. 
And I think that uh, if I am if I am correct uh, in this, I think that the Islamic tradition also holds similar beliefs, and that there are there are uh, seven heavens, right? Which are basically uh, is very coincidental with the seven heavens that Aristotle and Plato the world. And that book was translated from the Arabic into the Roman and Dante's book. And there's actually versions that say that Dante might have gotten he didn't plagiarize the book, but he might have gotten ideas from, from that book. Um, and there you go. Dante's Divine Comedy is one of the best classics of Western literature. But where did he get the inspiration from? It might most likely got it from a Muslim book right, that was circulating around and that was later translated either in Cordoba or Toledo or in many of these places. So, um, let me see, uh, I want to finish with this because I know that we don't have too much, uh, uh, too much time, but I wanted to finish with the expressions of artistic expression. I think that they are actually a good way to communicate, uh, to communicate this uh, interfaith dialogue. Uh, we have said that, the, we have talked about the Great Mosque of Cordoba and some of the arches that they have built. Now, if you look at this building right here, right? What do you think this building is? Well, you would think it would be a mosque, right? But it's not a mosque. It's a synagogue. It's a Jewish synagogue. But the Jews are actually of Toledo and the Jews of these other city-states, right? They build their mosque, they build their synagogues in the same style as the Muslim mosques uh, were built. In. And mainly because they were the state of the art artistic expression of the time. They were the best of the best architecture, right? And they were beauty in themselves. And also, there was a sort of like a, a sort of like an understanding that this is not just Muslim art. This is not just Islamic art. This is Andalusian art. See the difference between this is not Muslim, not just Muslim, but this is Andalusian. So Christians and Jews believe that they were part of that culture too. That was unique theirs. So this is another uh, picture here. Do, do they look the same? Or do they look very similar? It almost looks like the same architect building, right? Okay, so this is right here, this is the patio de los leones, the patio or the yard, the courtyard of the lions. Um, and this is actually, of the two, this is the Muslim palace. This is the palace of the Muslim rulers in the city of Granada. Okay. Now, this is the Alcázar Real of the Christian king of Sevilla. What's really interesting about this is that you would think that this one right here would be the Muslim rulers um, palace, and this one would be the Christian rulers palace. And the reason I say that is because of the figurative art here. You see, supposedly in Islam is not is not allowed to have this presentation of animals, right, and figurative art. But yet, the, uh, the Nasri uh, rulers in Granada, they make a fountain here showing uh, lions, right? Uh, and here, on the other hand, in the Christian's palace, there's no figurative art at all, which suggests that this looks more like the Christian, more like the Muslim palace than the Christian palace. So again, this, uh, if, not everything in Andalus and not everything there is black and white. There was an exchange of uh, ideas and an exchange of values that were expressed through art and architecture. I'm going to show you another example here. I don't know if you can see here, this is a window in the same building as this one right here. But this is in the interior of the building. This is a wisdom that has some Quranic verses inscribed in the wall, in Arabic. Okay. I don't know if you're able to see the calligraphy here, the Arabic calligraphy. Okay. This is a very common artistic uh, art form in the Muslim world. Since you don't represent figures, then you can, people got very creative in doing calligraphy and they've actually made these beautiful designs of the calligraphy. Right. Now, look at this window here. You would think that this also is a mosque, right? But it's, it's or is it a Muslim. Uh, this is the Muslim building, but it's not a Muslim building, this is a Jewish building. This is the building, or this is the wall of a building of another synagogue. Okay? 
And just like the Muslims have inscribed the Quran here in the wall, the Jews who made this synagogue inscribe Hebrew letters or Hebrew passages, right? most likely the Torah or their holy books right? here in the, uh, in the wall. But you can see that the intention is the same. Right? It's just that they grab the idea here, and basically it's just converting it, appropriating that idea for your own purposes. Another example here, tile work, ceramic work, um, is probably one of the most uh, beautiful uh, artistic forms. If you ever go to Spain or Portugal, um, people will go crazy showing you this. Okay? Because the Arabs really, uh, they uh, uh, excel in this kind of art. Um, the tile work that you see here, right, is part of what you see here is the tile work that you see here. This is also in the Alhambra in Granada. Now, you also see a tile work here. This is a palace in the city of Lisbon, in Portugal. Okay. And this particular room also has tile work. But what's the difference between this tile work and this tile work over here? <laughs> Apart from the color, the obvious, the size of the color. Are those birds? Those, are, those have birds here, right? And this is just geometrical figures, right? But isn't the artistic intention the same as to create tiles, right? It's to create symmetry, symmetry in the tiles, right? Only that instead of, uh, of stars, I am going to create some figures here on this particular piece of architecture. The same thing, the same thing here with these tiles over here. Okay? Uh, there is a word for these tiles. It's called, people in Spain and in, uh, in Portugal, they call it azulejos. Azulejos, uh, you who speak Spanish, you might think that it comes from the word azul, blue, but it doesn't come from the word azul. That actually comes from another word, uh, which means tile. Okay. Um, so again, another example. They look like very similar towers, right? <clears throat> they look like very similar towers. Well, this tower is in Sevilla, Spain, and this, was in, this one is in Morocco, in Marrakech, in Marrakech, in Morocco. Uh, the difference here is that the similarity is that the Almohads, which we have said were the North Africans who eventually made it into Muslim Spain, they built this building. It was the minaret of a mosque. You know, every mosque, you know, uh, in the, uh, traditionally, the mosque have a, uh, a tower, right, uh, from where the Muslim or the, the person calls the prayer, right, it goes and all the believers to come into the Muslim prayer. And some actually use it for, uh, for, for aesthetic purposes. When the rulers, when the Christians took Seville, they transformed the mosque into a church. That was not unusual too. The Ottoman church also did that in Constantinople, and they changed that church into a, into a big mosque. So the Christians, what they did was to create some this top part over here where they put angels and they put a bell and so on, but the building was pretty much the same as this one. And they didn't, they actually decided to leave that tower alone because they liked it so much, they thought it was so beautiful that they didn't want to get rid of the tower. And still, if you go to, uh, you go to Seville today, that actually has been known as the Giralda. That's the tower of La Giralda. Um, that's how they know it today in Seville. Does it have a circle? Can we see Right now, I think that in La in Quiranda is sort of like a museum. Yeah. So, but it's, it's a church. It's basically a, a, the tower where they have the, 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 the church bells. That's what they made it like. It was not that, but that's what they converted it to. But they, the point that I'm trying to make here is that the Christian kings that changed the mosque into a church or into a cathedral. They thought that the building was too beautiful to, uh, uh, to destroy and to remodel and build something else. So you find that it's very interesting that some Christian kings also, uh, uh, when they were in terror, when they were buried, you know, a good example of this is uh, this guy, Fernando III, in his tomb, right, he has, uh, he has in his sarcophagus, he had written in Hebrew and Arabic, right, his uh, epitaph, you know, like the, uh, the epitaph is like the, 
the statement, right, who the person was and the legacy that he left, right? So basically, in this epitaph, he's saying in Arabic and in Hebrew, he's very, very carefully saying, uh, this is the maximum King Fernando, right, a few, um, very um, true Lord and very uh, magnificent Lord, you know all these titles that kings give to themselves, right? Who, uh, who died in the year 650 of the uh, Hijrah, the Hijrah, right? Mm -hmm. Islamic calendar. The, the Islamic, he uses the Islamic calendar here, right? And then here, in the other epitaph, in the Hebrew one, he said he died in the year so-and-so, 5,012 since the creation of the world. That's the, that's the Jewish calendar. Okay? So that's, the, that's another example of Christian king. Right, admiring the cultures around him and not doing away with it. So the point that I'm trying to make here, guys, is that, uh, and to close the discussion now, I know we've gone a long way, we can discuss more and more about this, that's a very uh, passionate topic. Um, but the point that we, we're trying to make here is that, uh, is that not everything involving Christians and Muslims was black and white. Um, there was room for understanding, and there was room for cooperation, there was room for dialogue, there was room for communication and exchange, even during times of war, like even during times of war that happened. Okay? Um, there could be times, and this is actually to make the point, when the Christian kingdom was actually growing, when the Castilians were growing after the decline of the Cordoba Caliphate, right? and Castilla was now becoming the major power in Spain. Uh, the Spanish king actually could ally with either Muslims or Christians. They didn't hesitate to make alliances with either Muslims or Christians. So it was not necessarily a black and white fight between Christians and Muslims. That's not what happened in, in Spain necessarily. Okay? But history, especially in history in Spain, if you go to Spain in, in particular, the more uh, nationalistic, right, the Spanish version of history is that Islam was sort of like an intrusion. 800 years for the Christians to finally push it out there, and it became re-Christianized, for Christian. But that's not what it happened. We know here, we have been seeing the evidence that there was more than just that, that there was a natural and a sincere exchange of culture um, happening between Christians, Muslims, and Jews in al -Andalus. Okay, so... <clears throat> Uh, I want to do my final remarks then. Um, I don't think I'm going to have time to talk about the Jews, although I have given you some uh, important facts about how the Jewish people fare better in Al Andalus than in anywhere in Europe, anywhere before or arguably after. Even under the Almoravids and under the Almohads, we were not tolerant Muslims. Right? These were the more intolerant Muslims that ruled in Spain, the Moravids and the Almohads. They had nothing in common with the Cordoba Caliphate, which was more tolerant in Europe. Uh, Jews prospered under the uh, Berber rule, and the, uh, the Moravids and the Almohads. In fact, when Grana a Granadian Berber Muslim ruler, one of his best men and the right hand man was a prime minister, was a Jew, right? uh, by the name of Samuel Ibn Nagel. He was the right hand man of the Muslim. Uh, ruler of the city of Granada. <clears throat> um, so these are just examples that uh, I think are very important to bring up. So what do Al-Andalus teach us today? The Arabic of words in Spanish that we went over at the beginning, that people say every day in our Hispanic society, are part of eight centuries of interaction between Arab peoples who brought Islam to the Iberian Peninsula and locals who either converted to Islam or maintained their original faith but became Arabized. We saw evidence of that, right? <clears throat> People who did not convert to Islam but yet retained some kind of like uh, inclination toward the Arabic language. Right? That we owe a lot of our modern progress technologically, scientifically, and philosophically to the scholars and translators of the medieval Islamic world. Much of the astronomical, mathematical, literary knowledge that would revolutionized Western Europe in the modern era was transmitted from Al-Andalus. That includes the best of the medical work available at the time, that includes the best of astronomy, that includes also the best of mathematics, right? that includes the best of the, the maps actually, the most advanced maps at the time were also made uh, here. 
So think about it, without this technology, without this knowledge, the travels of exploration, the age of discovery would have not, been, uh, would not have been possible had this knowledge not been transmitted from, first from the Muslim world into the Christian world. In fact, the Renaissance, as we know it, the European Renaissance, you know, that we identify with the beginning of European progress and supremacy, right, would not have been possible at all had this transmission of knowledge not happened between the Muslim world and the Christian world. And uh, that door for that transmission was the Middle East, but definitely another important door for that transmission was Cordoba, uh, Al-Andalus, right, the Caliphate, and the rest of the other city-states and kingdoms that emerged after. Adoption of language, art, architecture, literature, and other cultural forms suggest a deeply embedded dialogue of civilizations. Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. That the sudden expression and back and forth dialogue by the way I paint, by the way I do the arches, by the way I build my synagogue, by the way I do my mosque or my cathedral, right? So there's a lot of that happening as well. Now, this is another important point. Religious fanaticism manifested in both Islam and Christianity in Spain at various points. Okay, so neither of these two religions were exempt from having periods of violence and fanatism. Uh, on the part of the Christian world, you know, we have the Crusades, we have a very militant type of Christianity that have nothing to do with the piety of Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ actually showed that you had to be another way, there was another way, another way of right. So it was not the way of, uh, of going and let's go and kill the infidels, right? Or God wills it, right? So that's not uh, what uh, the Gospels are about. <clears throat> Just as the Quran is not about what the uh, other, also other fanatics in the name of Islam have done, right? Uh, as we have seen from the Quran, we I recite some of the Quran verses here that we were able to see that the Holy Book of the Muslims, uh, Islam, it's very clear when it says that people have to be tolerated, that you cannot compel somebody to convert to a religion, right? That you have to respect the differences. That the people of the book are people who are also knowledgeable and are also fearful of God, and that they worship the same God as you, right? So we were able to see this in the um, uh, in the recitations of the Quran. The conflicts between Christian and Muslim in Spain seem to be more political than religious in nature. And that's shown by the fact that you have a Christian king who took over Toledo and took over Seville, right? But he was not throwing the Muslims out of there right away, right? So that did not happen. In fact, the Muslims became part of his own court, part of his own entourage. The Jews also became part of his advisors, right? Uh, his palaces looked like mosques, like the palaces of the, of the caliphs, right? That lived in Cordoba. So there was not a rejection of the supposed enemy, right? If there was some kind of like admiration for what that enemy uh, had. When societies and people, this is my final, uh, this is my final statement. When societies and people focus on their common values, they're likely to prosper more than when they obsess over their differences. Uh, the three monotheistic faiths have more conceptions of the divine, moral principles, and compassionate ethos and human rights traditions in common that many are willing to give them credit for. This realization is the strongest basis for a lasting interface, interfaith or interreligious dialogue that foster tolerance, cooperation and exchange in spite of fundamental differences. <clears throat> okay, so I want, to, um, I want to finish with this uh, citation and, uh, and again thank you for uh, being here tonight.
And some some things that we can have in common with those people, with anybody. So I think that when you have you can build circles and overlap those circles with the circles of other people, then you get rings. You know, like the Olympic rings. Yeah. You see them? We get that right. Rather than 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 rather than clashing. Rather than okay, well no no I am like this and you are like that. No no we're too different because I do this thing this way and you do it that way. Uh, no, 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 that's not the way it should be, this is the correct way, it should be this and that. So when you emphasize on that, I think that there's room for alienation. See, and, and what we need the least right now, especially in the, in, the, in, the, in the atmosphere we're living in the country right now, right, with presidential elections going on, with a conflict in the Middle East, with, uh, with the refugee crisis in Europe, right, with all of these things that we have, I think that we should emphasize more the uh, they could bring inclusion, right? What we have in common, because yes, we can. I can make a lecture here of all our differences, right? And I can be telling you this is how different we are. This is how horribly different we are, right? And uh, I want you to know how different we can be. What am I going to accomplish doing that? No, you're doing so beautiful. <clears throat> we need elbow room. Everybody to practice their own religion. Right, right. Everybody has their own space. You right. Know, we, you live in peace. Right. You know, not to the I, I happen to believe that when societies, again, we put it there, uh, what led to the success of the Cordoba Caliphate, which was short lived, again, it, it, it unfortunately it didn't last for too long, right? but what led to the golden age, if you will, was the openness that it experienced. It was a model. And was such a model that every other city, even Christian cities, wanted to imitate what Cordoba has done. So, so much about the Reconquista Christian against Muslims, right? When you have Alfonso VI and you have Fernando wanting to make Sevilla, wanting to make Toledo like Cordoba, that shows you that they have some appreciation, they respect that, right? They believe that learning, knowledge, openness produce a better society than actually one real by, by, by alienation, by hatred, by fanatism, by um, by correctness, you know, and, you know, and that there's no, no room for difference in diversity. Right? So, yeah, I think that's really bad. Any questions? Any more questions you have? Any, any commentary? Any last uh, remark you have? So, you, do you think uh, if, if, if the, what's the name of those? Castellanos, if they were in a world in Spain, would the New World be Muslim? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good question. Uh, that's, that's a good question. You see, it's kind of like making an alternative history. <laughs> it's very a, I mean, you can make a living out of that, right? But it's a, that's a very entertaining, you know, entertaining thought, right? So what would have been the case if the Muslims, rather than the Spanish, would have uh, been the ones that discovered the New World? Well, that's a, that's a very anachronistic question, I'm going to tell you why. The reason that the Europeans discovered a new world, first of all, it was not discovered. It was already discovered by the people who lived there, right? Uh, 100 million people who lived already in the Americas, right? Uh, and in fact, there's this evidence to suggest also that the Vikings may have reached uh, Canada at some point. So anyway, so that aside, uh, the reason that uh, the Spanish Conquer the new world is by going around. See? Now, Muslim Spain do not have that problem. If the Muslims have ruled Spain, they do not have a problem with having to go around the world and trade with China because Cordoba and then later the Muslim kingdoms of Granada, they have open contacts in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Right? So they would have continued to have Middle Eastern connections that allowed them to have that, that uh, trade. The Castilians did not have that advantage. The Castilians had. When they were actually, this is what happened, when the Muslims were reduced in power in Spain, there was another Muslim power emerging in the East, and that was the Turks, the Ottoman Turks. And the Ottoman Turks became sort of like the, the big Middle, Middle Eastern power. 
So it was very difficult to trade in the Mediterranean with the, with the Turks in the Mediterranean and also with the city-states of Italy, Venice, uh, Venice and Genoa and, and uh, um, Florence and so on. They controlled the Mediterranean trade. So that's when the Portuguese and the Spanish want to go around the world. That's what takes them around the world. It's because they want to avoid the Mediterranean. The Muslims controlling Spain may have had a better chance of dealing, having a good Mediterranean, uh, a good Mediterranean trade with the Ottoman Turks. So again, that's my speculation. I cannot tell you exactly what would have happened, but that's a good question. And, I uh, have an answer for that actually yeah. too, because I think traditionally, and I might be wrong, but traditionally Muslims don't try to um, oh. make other people convert to their religion, which is like you showed the quote, there is no compulsion in religion. And I know with the first couple of caliphates in Islam, after the Prophet Muhammad had passed away, you know, um, the Middle East, they didn't force anybody to become Muslim. You just convert it if you wanted to from your free will, from your heart. Because right. that's very important in Islam to have a clean heart and do things out of free will because God gave you that for a reason. Right. So I, I don't I don't know. I mean I know in the twentieth century and twenty first century we see an aberration of Islam, but I think classically and traditionally Islam has never tried to force people to become Muslim. Right. No Islam as a religion. Yeah. Islam as a religion itself it doesn't no. it doesn't it actually does not do that. But this is what happened. People in whatever religion are human beings. That's Okay, so this is what's going to happen. In Islam, you know, when you have a caliphate like the Prophet Muhammad, right? He had power over a certain amount of tribes in the Arabian Peninsula. Okay, so they were not used to imperial government. In other words, they never, the Arabs have never controlled an empire before. They didn't, they didn't know anything about empires, about administering other people's lands, you know, big, big empires. So they have to borrow, right, ideas from the Byzantines and from the Persians and from other peoples and they became monarchical, right? So the idea, for instance, that yes, there was a period in which Islamic armies, they conquered some areas, but again, it was not that, uh, it was not that uh, Genghis Khan type of conquest, right? In which, uh, you know, the Genghis Khan came into, uh, there's actually a story in the city of Baghdad, which was the rival city of Cordoba, right? Cordoba was so like the second Baghdad at the time, one of the most advanced cities of the world, but Baghdad was the first major Muslim city of knowledge. Uh, in the year of 1254, the Mongols came to Baghdad and they raised it to the ground. Mm -hmm. They raised it to, they literally raised it to the ground. They grabbed the, uh, they actually, because they failed to surrender, they wrapped around the caliph, or the, not the caliph, but the, the, the ruler of Baghdad, they wrapped him around in the carpet, mm -hmm. right, and they had the whole cavalry of the Mongols pass over, mm -hmm. right, over the guy. Uh, that's because the Mongols did not like to spill blood, so they have to wrap up the guy. <laughs> like that right. So again, I don't, I don't see, I don't see uh, the Muslims in certainly not in Spain. They did not do that. Uh, in fact, the, the the conquest in Spain was more like the, the this unity of the Visigoths than it was the vicious fighting of anyone in the. So mm -hmm. basically, the Muslims what they're doing, they were taking advantage of the huge vacuum being left by the Persians and by the Byzantines who have been fighting wars against each other. In mm -hmm. fact, if you read it, the, the Quran in the, in the Surah 30, it talks about the, uh, it, is, it was written, it was revealed around the time when the Persians and the Byzantines are still fighting that war. And in fact, if I remember correctly, the name of that Surah is Narum, which is the war for Rome, right? which is how the Arabs knew the Byzantines. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, again, uh, we don't see any of that. Uh, there are other Muslims who are going to be more brutal, like the Timorites in Central Asia, like Timor the Lame. I don't, I don't know if you guys probably Yes, who from, the act the India. In India, right? Mm -hmm. So he was the descendant, again, of Turks, of Mongols. That's when the Mongols converted to Islam, right? And uh, again, they were very brutal. And this guy was very brutal. Yeah. And he claimed to be Muslim. and. Again, uh, for people to say Islam is violent, then they will turn to Timur. Look what yes. Timur did, right? <laughs> Timur the Lane, he's a, you know, that's he, Islam. He actually laid the foundation of the Bigam Empire, Mughal Empire. In the Mughal Empire, 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 right. But what's ironic about it, well, you know more than uh, in your, in the Indian history is another universe, right? We can, uh, but in the Mughal Empire, which was another Muslim empire in India, ironically enough, uh, the Mughal rulers in India were relatively more tolerant than many of the rulers anywhere else, especially uh, under the rule of Akbar mm. uh, in the 17th century. Yeah. 
sort of like a, another Abdul Rahman the third, you know, sort of like the guy who brought people together, like left the Hindus alone. And, you know, and so so like this actually highlights that point that it has nothing to do with the religion. When Tamur came, he was more brutal. And the Akbar, he was, uh, I think, the grandson of Tamur. After Akbar, it was Shah Jahan, then, uh, sorry, after Tamur, it was Shah Jahan, then after Shah Jahan, it was Akbar. So the grandson, he was more tolerant. And even to, in today's right. history, the Indians make Milam films in like movies about Akbar, that oh, how yeah, good yeah. he was. So, and so, so it is nothing to do with religion. It's more right. human trait. That yes, person yeah, was yeah, more tolerant exactly. by nature. But his grandfather was not that tolerant by nature. Very, so I nothing to do with the religion. Now, like, take a, for instance, that's a, that's a good point. It's not a, it's not a religion, but it's the practitioners, right? Yeah. Some, but sometimes it comes to birth and, and religion. Like, take for instance the word caliphate. We'll be talking about caliphate, right? So now, the word caliphate, if you Google it, or if you look in CNN, or if you look in Fox News, immediately will take you to ISIS. <laughs> what? Because, they, because, because they claim to have built a caliphate, right? Uh, uh, what's the name of this guy? Abu Bakr al Baghdad <laughs> and all these terrorists, right? Using the name of Islam, right? To promote themselves in power and kill people mercilessly, right? You know, when you look at that caliphate, think about it for a moment, and how does it compare to the caliphate here in Cordoba? Yeah. I mean, what is, which is the true caliphate? You know, when you compare these two extremes, right? So again, it's very, it's very damaging to compare to say, look, Islam is ISIS, but why isn't Islam Cordoba? Why isn't Islam the fact that Christian kingdoms got along? with Muslim kings, right? Why is not that Islam also, right? But Islam has no basis whatsoever. There's no basis in Islam for what these people do in the name of Islam, right? Which is uh, conquest, uh, killing people, uh, doesn't have a racial impact. Uh, I'm going to venture to say that even within the Muslim religion, uh, these people might even have to, uh, a, to answer, right? For their crimes and the crimes that they committed, right? because they committed the worst crimes of all crimes, which is using the name of God for that particular uh, for that particular agenda. I think they're called tefillis. Actually, they're called people that cause like division within our own ummah, within our own family of people. And also, there's been fatwas that have been put out, especially from like Indonesia, with like hundreds and hundreds of mullahs, like our priests saying, no, this is not rooted in our religion, this is right. about power, this isn't about serving God. Yeah, so there's, uh, there's people who have come forward to making sure that, uh, uh, to distinguish between the religion, again, the Quran doesn't say that you should chop the head off of anybody, no. or that you should actually compel people to convert them, or that you should, uh, uh, I mean, act like a dog, really. You know, criminal. That's just the way. You know, for me, the, these people are not really Muslims. They're more like a. They're more like I think they found a man of the Russian mafia and the Mexican cartels and put it together. Yeah. That's what I just think. You know, they, they behave more like these the kind of thoughts than actual Muslims. So um, I, I think it's very important to know the difference. Okay. So well, uh, I want to thank you guys. Uh, for Forward for the next uh, for the next uh, lecture. Uh, we have tomorrow. We have another lecture. Uh, uh, Miss Jasmine and Sharif. She's going to be giving you a lecture here too. Very interesting lecture. We look forward to listen. I and mean, you can make it to that one, please. So we can make these uh, lectures a uh, continuous effort um, for not only this time but for other opportunities too. Okay. Um, <coughs> thank you, guys. Today's uh, lecture, and of course, um, on behalf of the Muslim Student Association, I'd like to thank Mr. Cabrera for coming in. You know, making, uh, giving us a good lesson on, you know, uh, religious tolerance and how it has applied to Islam and how we can, you know, some learn, take learn something from it. And again, a reminder: tomorrow we do have Ms. Shadi uh, giving her lecture on women in Islam down the hall in the Western Hemisphere. Crazy, which is no, 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 it's in the student center. It's two students. Uh, okay, 2.31. Okay, 2.31. Uh, that's at, I think it's 6 p.m. And, of 
course, yeah, I just want to go eat. Sunday we have the mosque open house and the lecture on Islam in America. We hope y'all can join. Thank you very much.